Japanese cinema, which has had such a strong influence on uh, uh, on several cinemas of the world, especially Hollywood, and we'll see how. So today, I thought that we will be looking, uh, we should be looking at uh, Japanese cinema, a brief overview, its history, and then the key people and the key movements. We did have something called Japanese new wave as well, that was in the 60s and the 70s. So, we should not consider just because we do not know much about our own uh, continent, the Asian continent that uh, new wave did not happen here. We did have a particular movement called the Japanese new wave. However, while considering the, uh, the Japanese cinema in its overview, we are going to look at some of the films from the earlier period, this also the silent era, the golden, the so called golden age of Japanese cinema. After the new wave, we will also look at J horror, which is such a popular category and the Yakuza movies. Anyone who is familiar with Yakuza movies? What is Waxia? W U X I A. Are you aware of Waxia movies? Waxia is Chinese, okay, is all those action martial arts movies. Yakuza movies are gangster, Japanese gangster cinema, okay. Uh, and we also have Korean cinema, which is so influential, so strong. We did excerpt from Korean cinema, we were talking about montage and we did old boy, remember. Hmm. So, the key people now, one is going to be uh, Kenzi Misugachi who was also known as uh, the Shakespeare of Japanese cinema, Ozu, Akira Kurosawa and Ozu, they belong to the golden age of Japanese cinema. Nagisha Oshima, are you aware of his films? Are you, are you aware of a movie called In the Realm of Senses? Note down the name, note down the title. These are very important films and you should be aware of this category also. Nagisha Oshima and then we had someone called uh, very very uh, influential filmmaker. If you uh, look him up, you will find any number of works on him. Takeshi Kitano, he is also known as Beat, yeah. So, you can imagine how cool he must be. And then we have Takeshi Miyake, who, uh, the, who has made the popular series of Ichi the Killer. I do not know how many of you follow these films but very influential and very popular. Meiji period, so I am talking, I am taking you back to the earlier cinema and what is the Meiji period? Emperor Meiji, okay, in Japan, his dates are 1960, uh, I am sorry, 1868 to 1912, 1868 to 1912 and uh, this was a period when Japan uh, came under the influence of western arts and theatres and also visual arts. So, if you look at this particular painting, just take a minute, look at this painting. It is Japanese, but uh, do not you find echoes from the European art as well, no? In what way? Hmm? Okay, their attire of course, the complete setup, it looks like uh, a very uh, uh, one of those uh, Monet or Renoir paintings okay, set in the countryside and uh, uh, depicting the world of uh, the elites in Japan okay. and, and look the way they are dressed up. Okay. It is very, very uh, modern, very western. Now, uh, taking you back to the silent cinema, early Japanese film audiences, they were because they had, they were the, uh, the generation which was the direct descendant of the Meiji period. So, they were familiar with western art and theatre. So, do not think that Japan is a very insular island and they are not aware of, unfortunately we are not aware much of, of uh, these countries, Japan and China of course, we know Ang Lee, Ang Lee has made it so big, John Wu. We will be talking about John Wu, he made Mission Impossible, do not forget that. Okay, so, we know John Wu, we know Ang Lee, we also know Zhang Yumu, the director of uh, um, Hero, 
okay, but Japan needs to be understood in a much better way. So, early Japanese silence were intentionally vague as all things Japanese they were vague, they were never over the top. However, there was one particular characteristics of uh, Japanese cinema of silent movies, the uh, narrator called Benshi. He was not just a narrator, he would not just tell the story, but he would also add his own touches to the story. Okay, so, you know we talk about folk theatre in our country, we talk about telling a story, the oral tradition. Okay, so, Benshi belonged to that tradition, where he would add his own personal touch, he, could, he would often make up the story. So, it was not necessarily what was going on on the screen, but he would also bring uh, in his own elements to the story. So, that is the major feature of the silent cinema and the, and the Japanese were always extremely interested in cinema. Okay, they would throng to the theatres and it is important to notice that they, they were not just interested in seeing watching the screen, but they also wanted people to tell you what is happening. So, therefore, Benshi is important. This never happened in anywhere else, not in Hollywood. Chaplin's cinema, a uh, silent movie, they would your uh, arrival of the train at the station. Remember all those movies, silent cinemas? No one would tell them what is happening, okay. but here they were expected to be told what is happening. So, they were ext always extremely interested in cinema. Now, uh, when cinema went talkies in Japan, uh, we had Kenji Misoguchi, often referred to as the Shakespeare of Japanese films. The story of the late Chrysanthemus is often regarded as his best work, although he has uh, like all greats, early greats, he was uh, um, he went unnoticed uh, for a very long period till Kurosawa brought attention to Japanese cinema and that he happened only in the 50s. But uh, Misoguchi made his uh, films in during the 30s and the 40s. And his another great movie is Tales of Yugutsu. He got some attention from the international critics, because it was always already the 50s. And in this film, he combines real with the supernatural to explore issues of love, honor, guilt, responsibility, family. And this movie, because of its uh, innovative aspects, is often compared to with Citizen Kane. So, it is uh, 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 Ugetsu is also known as Citizen Kane of Japan. Ozu is, uh, uh, of course, at the center as important as Kurosawa. So, Ozu, if you remember, we were talking about Paul Schrader, who has written book on Dreyer, Ozu, and Bresson. So, this is that Ozu. And his films, uh, basically he is known for his gentle home dramas, so family dramas, but very gentle, never melodramatic, never over the top. That is his beauty, very gentle, very sen uh, sensitive movies, not uh, that mushy sentimentality for Ozu. So, Ozu's films are known for attention paid to the everyday cares of domestic life. And I will show you certain uh, stills from Ozu's films and you will understand what I mean. So, some of the recurring motifs in his works are trains, empty streets, washing on a clothesline and telegraph wires. And what do these images convey? Everyday life, okay. nothing is spectacular, it is not like he is showing you enormous castles or mansions and he is not going over the top, he is no Cecil de Mill. Yeah, he is this. So, he is known for his home dramas. A standard theme in his films is the breakdown of the family structure in Japan as a consequence of modernization and urbanization and also the change in uh, uh, gender roles. What happens when uh, women start going out to work okay, and then 
what are the repercussions of this change. He is often know, uh, well known for his pillow shots, I will tell you what are pillow shots and uh, his evocative images remain separate from his scene. So, images are extremely important, he is a poet, he is basically a poet and he, the imagery, his poetic imagery on a screen is more important than individual scenes. He is often known for uh, poetic restraint as I was just talking about, he never goes over the top, never mellow, over the top melodramatic. Now, uh, we will come to a term called low angle shot and high angle shot. A uh, high angle shot is something shot from the top, a low angle shot is shot from below. In uh, our cinema, in our popular cinema, what does low angle shot denote? When you place the camera below, the person, the actor seems taller larger than life. We often use uh, this to mark our heroes, especially heroes entry. So, we see the shoes ok in the low angle shots ok, some of you are smiling. So, you know what I mean ok and why do we do that? They are larger than life characters. Hmm? So, make them appear extremely significant and important. This is not the case in Ozu, he uses low angle shot to con uh, to um, uh, denote something else, but what does he do? How does he do this? He would often place his static camera, his camera, we were talking about handheld camera and moving camera and all that, a panning camera, he does not resort to those uh, techniques at all. What he does is use a static camera and places it a few inches above the floor giving the audience an impression that they are sitting on a tatami mat. You know Japanese mats are they are called tatamis. Hmm? So, uh, we as if we are sitting on mats is the same eye line matching, we see uh, as if we are on also on the floor. In movies if you watch them very carefully you will find often filmmakers do not show, do not expose the ceilings and the floor that taken for granted that they are there. What happens when films makers start showing ceilings or floor? Well, the Citizen Kane was one of the first movies to expose ceilings. Sidney Lumet does it in Dog Day Afternoon, the entire movie is shot with ceilings exposed. You know Dog Day Afternoon? the highest movie with uh, Al Pacino in Brooklyn. It gives an impression of claustrophobia, closedness, hmm? when ceiling, when the room, is, the spaces are closing in on you, so that is the impression it gives. Now, Tokyo Story is Ozu's most popular and most well known movie, you must watch Tokyo Story, I recommend that you watch it. It is one of the most simply constructed, but also one of the forcefully told story of a breakdown of family relationships. The story is that uh, there is an old couple and they make a journey to Tokyo to visit their children and grandchildren, but then what happens as it often happens in most nuclear families, uh, the daughter in law and the son they do not have enough time, children go to school daughter in law goes out for work and so does the son and what does the old couple do? They just stay back, they have come here to interact with their children and their grandchildren, but it does not happen and they go back home. Okay. So, now uh, shortly after uh, the old couple returns home to their small town life, uh, the mother dies and then the children take a journey, because they have to participate in the last rituals of uh, the dead mother. So, this is a still from Tokyo story, the old couple and then when the daughter in law joins the father in law in Ozu, we were talking about wires, factory chimneys, so urbanization and modernization. He would not tell you, he will just show you, we were talking about showing directors, telling directors, he does not go over the top with his background music, 
almost like brazon, as austere, as ascetic as brazon and dress. A window shot. Ozu's other well known works include Floating Wheats, The Flavor of Green Tea Overrides, and Late Autumn. And this is very poignant to bear that his own gravestone, it bears just a character, a Japanese character, which means nothingness. Life is nothingness. So, think of the existential philosophy in Ozu, and that is very much implicit in his works. Since most of you are not aware of Japanese cinema, especially of that period, so no point in asking you questions, but do go and follow up with these films, especially Tales of Yugutsu by Misogashi and uh, Tokyo Story by Ozu. So, that you must be aware of J-horror. Before you arrived, we were just talking about J-horror. Are you? Is it about this like uh, horror movies like this uh, Japanese? Yeah, J-horror uh, is Japanese ring, horror. Uh, examples like Ring, Ring 2 yeah. movies. Ring. Yeah. The Ring is a good example. I am sure you have heard of the ring. Yeah. In Japanese, it was called Ringu. Okay. So, now the most well known, most popular director for Jap from Japan, at least you are, I am sure you are aware of Kurosawa, 1910 to 1988, uh, influenced a generation of filmmakers. Any number, his films have been adapted and reworked in several Hollywood films also. So, one of the most respected fil filmmakers in Hollywood and as it happens, he uh, uh, in his home country, he attracted a lot of jealousy, because he was one of the most, it always happens, okay. <laughs> it is human nature, because he was one of the first, not just one of the first, but he was the first to garner that kind of attention and that kind of reception from the western world and that uh, uh, people at home were extremely dismissive of him. They never gave him his due back home in Japan, but Kurosawa as we all know is a master. So, uh, the first Japanese filmmaker to gain international uh, recognition, he is known for a very long and distinguished career. He made films till uh, 19s. I am sure you are aware of a movie called Dreams. Yes, yeah. And uh, he acted uh, alongside uh, Martin Scorsese as well. Okay. I will talk about that. So, uh, Kurosawa was familiar with western literature and arts and was deeply interested in painting. So, if you watch his movies like Ran, are you aware of Ran? Yes, okay. you will, it's like, it's painterly, every shot is like a painting, you have to watch it to believe it. Okay. His first film was uh, Sugata Sanshiro and who did he work with, the famous actor? Good. The Shiro Mifune, we will talk about him. Then, uh, The Quiet Duel, Stray Dog, The Drunken Angel, all these movies of the 40s. He also employed and experimented uh, the techniques of uh, the Soviet montage and followed the classical Hollywood narrative. You are no strangers to classical Hollywood narrative now. Okay. So, Kurosawa is recognized as a master technician and a stylist. And reflects a deep sense of humanity for his characters. Now, uh, he awakened the West and we are talking about his most popular film now, Rashomon, which won the top prize in the Venice Film Festival of 1951 and also a special Oscar for best foreign film. So, that is uh, Tashiro Mifun and they, together they worked on several films. It was like one of those De Niro and uh, Martin Scorsese relationship, actor director and Jean Pierre Le and Truffaut, they always acted together. Uh, if you remember, Jean Pierre Le, uh, the child actor from 400 Blows, and then he went on to act in several other films with uh, Truffaut, remember? Okay, I am sure that you shoot the piano player, etcetera, when he was a grown up kid. And he had a nervous breakdown when Truffaut died of brain hemorrhage at a very young age. Truffaut was just in his early 50s, 52 or 54. 
and the actor he had been working on all those movies, he had a nervous breakdown. We are all often told that uh, when Martin Scorsese was going through that drug period of his, remember he fell into the substance abuse period and he would was not able to make any more films and De Niro would often go and throw his scripts on him. Let's come back to work, I mean that is the only way you can get Scorsese out of that period. And Scorsese, believe it or not, before Raging Bull was so ill that uh, the doctors told him that you have now just a few months to live. And De Niro sort of, you know, when he gave him the script of Raging Bull, brought him back from near death. So, that is the kind of relationships and collaborations you used to have and therefore, these kinds of films. Okay, so, Rashomon, I am sure most of you are at least aware of. If you have not watched it, please do watch it and uh, it really opens uh, new horizons for you. Because see, it was one of the first movies to explore the concept of multiple perspectives. Today, every second movie has multiple perspectives, multiple parallel stories running. You have Babel, you have all these Inuritu movies and all. It also dealt with the same thing, uh, multiple uh, narrations and some of them, I think in Tamil they say… Preceded Rashomon? Yeah, it's exactly. It is uh, it starts Ivalji Ganeshan and uh, the screenplay was written by Anna Durek. Mm -hmm. And it has the same kind of narration, a uh, guy gets killed and uh, three different people saying three different ways. Mm -hmm. It just kind of set in contemporary times. Yeah, Virumadi does it again. Yeah. So, that is another popular movie. So, thank you for bringing that to my attention. So, uh, those of you who are not familiar with Rashomon's plot, it is an anecdote presented four times. There is a nobleman traveling through the thick forest uh, with his beautiful wife. The wife, uh, they are attacked by a bandit played by Tashirumifune. The wife is raped and the nobleman uh, is indulges in a duel with the bandit and the man is killed, husband is killed as well. This episode is narrated through the perspectives of the wife, uh, the bandit, a witness, a silent witness, the woodcutter who has been watching the entire event uh, while he was hiding in the woods and then the spirit of the dead man, he, he finds a medium and uh, through that particular medium, he narrates his version of the story. Um, Rashomon is based on two stories by Rayanasake Akutagawa and uh, Rashomon and In a Grove. So, there are two movies, th there are two short stories, Rashomon and In a Grove. So, Kurosawa uses the description of the ruined gate and the atmosphere of the alienation and desolation from the Rashomon story. And various testimonies, multiple perspectives from before the police in a rape case from in a grove. So, he combines, collapses two stories and makes them into one masterpiece. Tashiro Mifune from Rashomon, the wife telling her perspective and now the, uh, the word has become so popular that it has come to become a part of our lexicon, popular lexicon, the Rashomon effect. That means, there is no single there is no single truth. Okay, so, there is no point in uh, the so called quest for truth, going for a quest for truth, you know there are no grand narratives, okay, but there are several multiple tales, stories, that is the idea. So, there is no truth, but everything depends on perception and this idea has been reworked and revised in several movies particularly Courage Under Fire, it is a Hollywood movie 96, Hero, Chinese movie by Zhang Yumu 2002, Vantage Point, yeah, we all know that movie 2008 and Virumandi of course. Uh, Rashomon was made in Hollywood by Martin Ritz uh, as Outrage in 1964. 